Welcome to the 2008 finals of the California Clean Tech Open. This is a really, really special day. Uh, it might take a while to sink in. Uh, this incredible congressional act that's providing $200 million a year uh, to help uh, where we're all going. And uh, the first $40 million of that is going for uh, green building to the national labs. And the first 100000 of that is going to us. And we are thrilled. Thank you very much, Department of Energy and National Labs. We're very proud to be here, to uh, be the sponsor again uh, for the Summer Workshop Series. We recognize the value of uh, linking industry leaders and the entrepreneurs and uh, the enterprises of the future with our laboratories and the scientists at the Department of Energy through public-private partnerships. That's key for us and we'll be here with you at these summer seminars sharing our technical information because we know it's these workshops, these seminars that will help educate uh, the teams as they move towards uh, the final judging. And it's critical that uh, we can participate with you in this process in the early stage project development from developing a sound business plan to developing your pitches. We're also very excited to be a sponsor for the expansion of the Clean Tech Open. Uh, it's an idea that's too big just for California. Uh, and so we're moving to Denver uh, this year and maybe uh, other uh, parts of the country in the future. So thank you again uh, for your efforts. So let me introduce uh, a man who's brought religious zeal, Jeffersonian vision, and business acumen to the Department of Energy, Andy Karsner. I'm excited that my last address is here in California, the place I always call the Creative Coast, in front of the people that are doing the real work. Uh, the folks that we work for, you all, the entrepreneurs that are making a real difference happen. But I want to point out who's on the stage with me here tonight. Uh, Bob Rosner from the Argonne National Laboratories, Steve Chu, the director of the Ber Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Bobby Garrett, who's the deputy director at NREL, Dan Arvizu sends his regrets, Tom Mason from Oak Ridge National Laboratory in, in uh, Tennessee, and Michael Clues from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. These, these gentlemen and, and Bobby are... are uh, are um, really the muscle behind what happens next in terms of the United States government's capacity to lean into research and development and deployment and commercialization at scale in a time frame that's consequential. And unfortunately, their laboratories and the people who work for them have had to deal with this particular subject matter really on a reactive basis over the years. What would Congress give them? What is the relative priority against other priorities that we focus on for scaling uh, uh, alternative fuels or, or uh, uh, nuclear energy? So many competing priorities. And now this priority has risen to the top of the list. And so all the talk in the world about what's going on special over here or over here in a very siloed and stovepipe way, these folks have all gotten together and said, we can break that down. We are all national tre treasures, these national laboratories, these places where the Manhattan Project was born, these, these places that uh, gave birth to the Human Genome Project and artificial retina and possess the advanced photon source and the, and the, and the uh, uh, neutron spallation source. All these, all these technologies and scientists gathered away, dispersed around our country, they are saying we will bring together, we will bring all of our equities into a single pool and it will be greater than the sum of its parts as we begin to attack the built environment. Transform the built environment, not just rhetorically, but on a time frame that we measure with metrics on their progress, taking a systems-wide approach, not focusing on any one technology winner. And what we're announcing today, this commercial building initiative, statutory authorizations of up to $200 million per year for research and development and deployment, and then organize ourselves through a laboratory collaborative that can manage this and work together with the private sector and with you all, the entrepreneurial community, and with the universities, and get a coherent strategy and framework in place for this nation to reduce its dependence on carbon-based fossil fuels to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, and believe it or not, to do it all profitably. You know, I, I sometimes get told, don't say that again, don't, don't call them agents of disruption. It almost, has a, it almost has a seditious, 
you know, insurrection tone to it. You can't have introductions of disruptive technology that you are working on today. You can't have that introduced at a scale and in a time frame that is consequential without disruptive policy and without disruptive organizational and institutional frameworks. That sounds very bureaucratic. That sounds Washingtonian. But the truth is we are still postured for a Cold War. And that's why these folks have been reacting. Even though they have the science, even though they have the technologists, even though they have the commitment, the wherewithal, the greatest intellectual capital on earth in their national laboratories, we haven't given them an organizational platform before today to collaborate and be proactive and lead. And that's what we're announcing today. The implementation of the bipartisan provisions of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 that allow us to transform our built environment and avail ourselves of the enormous jump that we intend to see from statutory authorizations, greater investments in our children's future, the future they really deserve to inherit. What are we talking about? You probably already know that the built environment constitutes the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Vice transportation, vice industry, power generation, almost 40% of the energy we use in the United States today, approximately 40 quadrillion BTUs, we call them quads. And what they've committed to one another in a room today that I think is just positively historic is to say, let's come up with the metrics for six months and 12 months and two years and five years and 10 years and let's rate how we are doing constantly to what the national objectives are. Let's forget policy by balloon payment. I mean, that's really what we're into now. If you just say everything is just over the horizon, almost beyond our reach, but definitely beyond my current election cycle, you're in good shape. These folks are going to hold us to account. Doesn't matter who wins the next election. They're going to work with the treasury of our national scientific and technological, intellectual capital to get this done. That's where you all sit, on the brink of solutions that are profitable with returns that can be replicated, that can be proliferated, that can be expanded, that can penetrate our markets and make a difference and show the world what U.S. leadership looks like when you marry innovation to entrepreneurship, science to commerce. Those things are our heritage. They're our birthright. It's who we are. This thing about efficiency, when it was taught to me, because I was a military kid, it was always, you know, there's somebody else suffering in Southeast Asia. Eat your peas. The same founding fathers that encouraged us as national ethos to find the pursuit of happiness from their same wills came a penny saved is a penny earned, which is no different than a BTU saved is a BTU earned or a kilowatt hour saved is a kilowatt hour earned. Resourcefulness is who we are. It is our heritage. It is our birthright. It is what built this country. Nobody ever got to the West on the back of waste. That is the aberration in the American experience. And we can and will reconnect with our national ethos either at the end of foresight and vision or on the back of reactive pain. With the great leaders who are assembled in front of you today who I encourage each and every one of you to meet because I have seen them on the world stage. I know what assets they possess. It is incredible to have them all here we will have the foresight and vision to bring people together, starting with the people of these national laboratories, to deploy these technologies in a time frame that matters, and to reconnect with the leadership that we can be, that we will be, in an era of problem solving. I'm grateful to have served you. Thank you all for having me this evening.